a dream is when you take something good and make it ultimate. That is going to break your heart. You can't rely on that. God let that die so he could save me from myself. I was more important to God than the work I was doing for God. And I came out of that with a genuine relationship with God. My name is uh, Mark Schlesinger. I've been a leader here at IHOP KC for the past 11 years. And I'm here with Phil Vischer, who is the creator of Veggie Tales. Uh, profound, massive impact. Yeah, the master. The master, amazing. So we're excited to be with him. I'm also with Lenny LaGuardia. He is a senior leader here at IHOP KC, executive director of the Children's Equipping Center and uh, responsible for over 30 years of ministry uh, to young people has personally impacted many, many children. For three and a half decades, I've, I've championed uh, equipping children and uh, became aware of your resources early in my ministry and it's just, I'm so grateful for you. What do you feel about this project that you're embarking on? Relaunching VeggieTales. So I haven't worked on VeggieTales uh, for about a decade. I haven't owned it for 16 years. So in that time, it's gone through three other owners, finally ended up at um, Universal Studios. NBC Universal is the current owner of VeggieTales. The folks at Trinity Broadcast Network who want to make kids programming and I've always loved VeggieTales approached Universal and said, hey, would you let us, could we do something together to bring VeggieTales back? And Universal was completely open to that. So they both reached out to me and, and said, hey, would you get involved creatively if we can relaunch VeggieTales? I said, sure, but I, I want to make it like the old ones, like the classics. Uh, and they said, yeah, that's what we want too. And Universal said, yeah, that seems, that makes sense. Those are the ones that people loved. So let's make it like the classics. And uh, so that's led to a new show that's kind of based on the old show, but it's in a different setting. My favorite show as a kid uh, growing up was The Muppet Show. And, and I love The Muppet Show because it had that variety show format so they could do just completely wacky things that were short or longer or whatever. But you also got to see backstage. You got to see behind the curtain and, and see Kermit the Frog freaking out because it was going horribly, you know, and Fozzie Bear coming up with weird ideas that wouldn't work at all. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to do a variety show with Bob and Larry, you know, where Bob is trying to keep the show together. But you can go backstage and see how poorly it's going backstage with Bob. And they said, yeah, we love that idea. Let's do it. And so we're doing 18 episodes of this show where every wow. day, you know, Bob wow. and Larry have to come up with a new show, a uh, new theme. What are we teaching? What's it about this week? And all the friends are suggesting weird ideas, you know, that may or may not work. And Bob has to try to deliver the show on time and answer the question from the kid that came in in the letter and figure out how to, you know, make it work. And it's, so it's been a lot of fun. And it's fun because they're 22-minute episodes. You can do little stories, so, which means I can do smaller, more obscure Bible stories. You can do things like a, uh, an eight-minute musical version right. of Paul and Silas in prison. We're going to give you a Bible story that you've maybe That's never awesome. heard before. You know, recently I heard a speaker say that uh, the second most commanded thing in the Bible is to sing. Singing is a major part of what we do here at the International House of Prayer, obviously 24-7, uh, 365 for the last 20 years. We obviously you know, believe in the power of song, but really obviously believe in the, in the power of the one that we sing to. We want to raise up singers and musicians to do Bible clubs and to do outreaches. And so we're taking children all over the city. So I'm really excited about uh, your heart in this particular area because yeah. I really believe that uh, it's gonna release in children their gifts and their talents. If the songs are geared to kids, right. You know, which doesn't mean you're talking down, but it means that you're, you're simplifying, not, not simplistic, but simple. You know, so, so simpler melodies, cause they're catchier. Uh, simpler phrasings because they're catchier. You know, and so when I did the What's in the Bible series, I think I wrote 90 songs to go through that series. Wow. Um, every time we finished a key bit of teaching, I doubled back and now put that in, in the form of a simple song to make the lesson sticky. So I want to take all these key concepts from scripture. And that's, I mean, that's why the book of Psalms exists 
to take key concepts and prayers and then put them in a form where people could uh, express them together and repeat them. So you, they get embedded in your brain. The old Veggie Tales were very, very focused on the scriptures. You could do it with humor and uh, with all the dynamics that we love. T talk to us a little bit about that, Phil, like that passion well, to get the word. Post Veggies, I did a series called What's in the Bible, which is a 13 DVD series to walk kids all the way through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And that was really coming out of Veggie Tales thinking, what's next, God? And the answer was, take them deeper. Everyone's culture affects their theology in ways that they don't see. Mm. You can't see your own culture. You know, it's just the water you're swimming in. You can't see it, but it's affecting everything else that you do and believe. And I realized, you know, I got off track building my company when I was doing VeggieTales um, because I had adopted this, this, this view that, you know, you need to have a dream. It needs to be a big dream. It needs to be good, not like for evil. Your dream should not be evil. You don't want to take over the world in a bad way, but you do want to change the world in a good way. Then you need to come up with something specific, and then you need to ask God to bless it, or you know, decide that it's from God, and then never let go of your dream. Why do you never let go of your dream? Because that's a song in America. And so we do things like we look at the, the appearance of dreams in the Bible, whether it's Joseph, you know, or, or Peter, or whomever, anyone who had a dream, Daniel, it's like, aha, he had a dream and God made his dream come true. So God's going to make my dream come true too. You know, and, and we never stop to think, are we talking about the same thing? When the Bible talks about dreams and when our culture talks about dreams, is it the same thing or is it a little bit different? And when you realize a dream in the Bible is a vision, and it's actually a divine revelation. In our culture, a dream is a desired outcome. You know, I, it, I want, that's a dream. That's very different than a biblical dream. In the Bible, um, a, typically a dream is never present tense. No one in the Bible says, I have a dream. They say, I had a dream. Okay, so, if, so when I say, I have a dream, I'm already, that's not a biblical dream. Uh, a dream in the Bible almost never makes the person who receives it happy or excited. It, it either terrifies them or confuses them. So I had to realize, okay, my dream was to build the next Disney and to be Walt. That was my dream. Wow. And I, I was going to hang on to it no matter what, because you never let go of your dream. Because that's like giving up on life. Okay, anything that you are unwilling to let go of other than God is an idol. You know, Tim Keller said it, a dream is when you take something good and make it ultimate. Something good, you've made it ultimate. And anything you make ultimate other than God will let you down and break your heart. You know, so God isn't being a jerk saying, let go of your dream. Can't have that dream. I just want you to focus on me because I'm jealous. No, he's saying that is going to break your heart. You can't rely on that. I am the thing. When you make me your ultimate, I am the only one that won't let you down. You know, and that's what just killed me losing VeggieTales was I wasn't just losing VeggieTales. I was losing my dream. I was losing my source of identity. You know, I was losing this, but this is how I'm going to change the world for God. People will say he did something valuable for God. You know, he's one of the good ones. And, and that, <laughs> that was all I wanted. I just wanted to be one of the good ones, you know, it's, and, and it was amazing that God let that fall apart. It was amazing to me that God let that die so he could save me from myself because mm. he valued me more than he valued what I was doing for him. And that was a very new idea for me, that I was more important to God than the work I was doing for God, so much so that he would let it die so that he could just be with me. And I came out of that with a genuine relationship with God that I hadn't really had before because I was always, I was an employee of God, not a son of God. And I was ready to take orders and I was ready to go, you know, kill myself on the altar of doing something good. But I was also miserable and that's not, figuring out that's actually not what God wants for me. He didn't want me to be miserable because that's not, misery is not a fruit of the spirit. So Phil, you've been around a long time, and so I'm facing challenges just 
helping children understand prayer and, and the word and raising up a Bible literate uh, culture among our children. And I really feel that the project is always going to impact the children, but it's also going to teach those that are teaching the children more about the Bible. I have a lot of compassion for parents yeah. um, who go to church and the pastor says, you have to disciple your kids. And they look at each other and say, who discipled us? How the heck do I know how to disciple my kids when nobody discipled me? And so that's partly why I always try to do stuff that's fun to experience together with your kids. If it's so dull or if, it, if there's no humor in it for, for grown-ups, you know, right. so that the grown-ups tune out, well, then they're not learning anything. If I can make something that's enjoyable enough that the parents will sit down and watch it with their kids, I realize they're all paying attention, you know, and they will learn together and they will apply it together. And the kids will remind the parents of what they've learned and the parents will remind the kids of what they learned. And as a family, they will build faith uh, because we have, we, we cannot assume that today's parents know what they're supposed to be teaching their kids. So we need to find tools that are replicatable. And, and that has to be resources that even a parent that hasn't learned anything can enjoy applying with their kids. And that's what I try to do. I love that, Phil. Talk to us a little bit more about the, the new Bible. It's, I believe it's called Laugh and Learn. So it's 52 Bible stories. Uh, it takes about five minutes to read each one. Uh, we start with creation. We end with the new heaven and the new earth. And we go all the way through. And what I'm trying to do is, is paint the overarching storyline of the Bible so that kids can see this is a really big unified story. It explains why the world is the way it is, what God is trying to do about it, is going to do about it, and how do I fit into that story? You know, do I have a place in that story? Because we, we can do two things with kids. Uh, we can, when they turn 10 years old, we can give them an NIV or an ESV study Bible and say, good luck. So nine out of 10 kids die somewhere in Leviticus. They die in the desert like the Israelites. <laughs> Uh, they never make it any further. Or on the other end, we say, okay, so we have to really simplify this for kids. So let's just pick, let's just pick five or six stories, preferably ones with cute animals in them, and then we'll make them, you know, standalone stories for the kids, and we'll put them in a kiddie pool that's so shallow they never have a chance to learn how to swim. So we're either throwing them off the deep end, and they're drowning in Leviticus. Or we're putting them in a, in a kiddie pool that's so shallow they never get to test their ability to swim. And there has to be something in the middle where we're, we're creating a shallow end of the grown-up pool, you know, mm -hmm. where we're actually summarizing the Bible, not just cherry-picking stories that are appealing to children and leading them all the way through that arc so that they have the storyline. So at least when they go to a full-text Bible and they see Leviticus, they know what it is. So they have an understanding of the whole Bible and, and most importantly, so they can see that it is a cohesive narrative that explains why the world is the way it is, what God is doing about it and what role they can play in that. Phil, for all the people like in our audience that track with IHOP KC that are going to be really interested in the new Veggie Tales and the Bible um, that you're releasing, the Laugh and Learn where do they go to find out more information about when that's coming out? Um, what are their next steps? Right. Uh, the uh, VeggieTale stuff, there's a Christmas special, which was the first thing that went into production. It's, it's an 18 show season, but the first one we did was a Christmas special. That will be out this fall on DVD in October and then on TBN broadcast in November. Then the rest of the VeggieTale series is sometime next year when it launches, but they haven't said yet. So can't see that yet. The uh, Laugh and Learn Bible for Kids is out now, right now, as we speak, right now. You could go and find it wherever you find books. Go to Amazon, type in Phil Vischer Bible, and it'll, it'll pop up. It's pretty easy to find. 10 years from now, what do you want us to say about what you're doing right now, 10 years from now? What do you want said? I think there's an opportunity to tell feature length stories again. I don't think we've seen how much impact a movie could have that appeals to the whole family um, that has God, you know, as, as a major character. And I would love to have done that 
yeah. you know, in the next 10 years to really have seen what the potential is uh, for turning families out to theaters nice. to have an experience like a Pixar movie, but with God in it, in a world where God exists. But I just worry about kids growing up in a media world where God is never a character. Mm. You know, even if there's Judeo-Christian values, which a lot of the Pixar movies have Judeo-Christian values because a lot of the guys that work there, you know, grew up in church and just have that kind of in their, their heads in the background. Kids never see in media a world where there is someone behind the curtain who loves you, you know, and that concerns me considering how much media kids are consuming. So I, I do want to push further um, without killing myself, push further with God in the direction of can we tell larger scale stories that have more right. cultural visibility? And I would like to try to return there in the next 10 years and, and see what can be accomplished. That's amazing. Thank, Thank you so sir. much, Phil. You're Thank welcome. Thank you so much. It means so much to us. You're welcome. Thanks well, for all you've done. Congratulations on, on what you guys are doing too and, and uh, keep it up. Keep the faith. Absolutely. We will. But don't, don't let it become an idol. Yeah. Amen. It's good.